This is my annual AP Computer Science A exam primer uh, to give you a little bit of insight into the logistics and structure of the exam and to let you know what things you should worry about and what things you shouldn't worry about. Uh, so I hope you find this reassuring as we prepare for our uh, in-class final exam um, in preparation for the actual AP exam. So here's the structure of the AP CSA exam. It's broken into two parts. Uh, the multiple choice part uh, has 40 questions and you have 90 minutes to do it. Uh, that works out to just over two minutes per question. Um, that is the pacing we've been using all year. Uh, so you should find that familiar. In some ways, I think the pacing is easier on the actual AP exam because in the 40 questions, there are some questions that may take a little longer and some questions that may take a little less. And because there are more questions, it tends to average out. Um, so you should find the pacing not only familiar, but maybe a little bit more flexible than on our unit exams. Uh, you get to use the APCSA Java Quick Reference, um, and it's provided for the multiple choice. Uh, there's no penalty for guessing, so please make sure you answer all 40 questions. Um, after the multiple choice, my understanding is you get a short break, and then you have the free response. Uh, the free response are, there are four questions. We'll talk more about those four questions in a moment. You have 90 minutes for that portion as well, and you continue to get to use the APCSA Java Quick Reference. Both halves of the exam are equally weighted. Uh, so um, yes, there are 40 questions on multiple choice and 36 points on the free response, but they balance those out when they calculate your raw score. Uh, so both parts are equally weighted. Um, according to the College Board, here's the breakdown in the multiple choice in terms of um, the percentage of questions that address each of these topics. You'll note that this adds up to more than 100% because a single question may assess multiple topics. Um, the range is here because they look to cover all the topics in a balanced way across the multiple choice and free response. So based on the free response questions, there may be more or fewer uh, multiple choice questions on a given topic. Um, but some interesting things here, as you can see, certain areas are hit pretty hard. Um, there's a lot on if statements, there's a lot on while loops, um, arrays and array lists combined at least uh, hit a lot, um, especially if you add in 2D arrays, that's a ton. Um, so just be prepared for that. Uh, we've been doing recursion, uh, which is five to seven and a half percent, which means it's just like probably a couple questions, um, but that's, uh, still uh, important. All right, here are some assumptions you should make as you take the multiple choice portion. Um, you should assume that the classes listed in the Java Quick Reference have already been imported when appropriate. Um, they're not trying to trick you uh, with a question where it's like, haha, we didn't import the class and so this code doesn't work. Um, you should assume that the declaration of the variables and the methods appear with the, in the context of an enclosing class they're not going to show you an entire class or an entire file. Um, they're just going to focus on the relevant portions. Again, they're not trying to trick you. They're trying to let you focus on the relevant portion of the question. So those are reasonable assumptions to make. You should also assume that method calls that are not prefixed with a variable that references an object um, or a class name, um, and they're not shown within a complete class definition, they appear within the context of the enclosing class. Like again, they're not trying to trick you with stuff like that. Um, they're just trying to write code um, and provide it in such a way that it is um, focused on the key aspects and not a lot of extra stuff that you don't really care about. Um, here's a, an important one. Um, unless it is otherwise noted in the question, and occasionally it is, usually it is not, you can assume that the parameters in the method calls are not null and the methods are called only when the preconditions are satisfied. Okay. Um, these are all reasonable assumptions to make. And I guess if I were to sum up all four of these bullet points, it would be that they're not trying to trick you on the multiple choice. They're trying to assess if you understand the key um, learning objectives that are defined. Uh, so just keep, keep that in mind. Don't, don't overthink these questions. All right, free response questions, second half of the exam. Um, in recent years, they have restructured their free response, and now each of the four questions um, each year focus on a specific type of question. Uh, did not used to be this way. 
Um, but for the last few years, we know that the first free response question will focus on methods and control structures. Um, so think like if statements, loops, um, that's what we mean going on there. Um, the second question will be the class question that could focus on everything from writing a complete class definition, like we studied last semester, uh, to something involving inheritance, uh, which is something that we studied um, more recently. But both of those would fit into that question. Um, the third question will be an array or array list question. I guess technically an array and or an array list question. Um, some of the more challenging uh, third FRQ questions focus on both arrays and array lists combined into the same question to assess that you can tell them apart um, and make sure you use the appropriate syntax for each. Um, and the fourth FRQ question will be a 2D array question. Um, and so it's kind of nice knowing what to expect. Um, and next week we will focus in class on each of these four types of free response questions explicitly. <coughs> Assumptions you should make on a free response exam. You can assume that the classes listed in the Java Quick Reference have been imported. You don't need to worry about imports of those classes um, as you write your FRQ. Again, similar to the multiple choice, unless otherwise noted in the question, and sometimes it is, um, <coughs> assume that the parameters and method calls are not null, and that methods are called only when their preconditions are satisfied. Okay. Um, Remember, preconditions are, are usually there in the, the comments, the javadoc style comments for a method. They are telling you things you can assume to be true, meaning you do not need to write code to check those. So don't write code because you might write it wrong and be penalized. Um, and don't write code because that takes time and you don't have time. Um, so make good use of your time and uh, don't worry about the preconditions. Um, when you write the solutions for each of these questions, you can use any accessible methods that are listed in the classes defined in that question. Please be careful because writing significant amounts of code that can be replaced by a call to one of those methods that's defined in the class and the prompt will not receive full credit. You are expected to realize you can call that method um, and use that instead. So do be aware of that. All right, we do a lot in this class. Not about a lot. We do several things in this class that go beyond the AP Computer Science A curriculum. And I wanna be upfront about that because I don't want you to focus your review efforts on these topics or to be worried about these topics because um, they're not gonna show up on the test. And at this point in the year, our focus is on the test um, and making sure you're prepared for that experience. Uh, we learned about the char type. Um, that primitive type is not part of the APCSA curriculum. Um, that's when we did like the char matrix class with the, uh, the chop game. Um, we did a lot with graphics, right? Line 2D dot double, graphics 2D, frames, panels, things like that. Um, none of that is part of the APCSA curriculum. Uh, you won't see graphics stuff on there. We learned a little bit about abstract classes. They are no longer part of the APCSA curriculum. We learned a bit, uh, quite a bit about interfaces and interfaces are no longer part of the APCSA curriculum. So when you think of our object oriented design unit, simply the chapter, well, not simply, but at least only the chapter on inheritance um, is a uh, part of the APCSA curriculum. Um, so that can focus your review. We certainly learned about recursion and practiced writing recursive methods. I think that's essential to truly understand recursion. Um, but as I've mentioned, re writing recursive methods on the free response is not part of the APCSA curriculum. So I hope this gives you uh, a little bit of reassurance in terms of narrowing the scope of what to expect on the test um, and narrowing the scope of your review efforts. All right, a couple of cautions. You may, um, there are many resources available to you uh, on our AP review module in Canvas. Uh, you are certainly, um, also encouraged to keep using our AP review book, uh, where a lot of our prep for the final exam was assigned out of. Um, but of course you might search other stuff up online and that is fine too. A couple of cautions related to that. Um, the time for the split between the exams um, or each portion of the exam, the multiple choice and the free response changed starting in 2016. Um, so be aware if you look at some older exams, 
um, the time was not what it is now. Uh, so if you take a really old practice test or something and you're like, ooh, I ran out of time, uh, that you might be just fine, right? So just keep that in mind. Um, there used to be something called Grid World in APCSA. It was the case study. It was dropped in 2015. So it's been a few years now, um, but from time to time, you still see um, some review materials that refer to it. Um, there's nothing about Grid World anymore on the exam. Um, please don't worry about that. All right, so that's my primer for the exam. The next thing I wanna share with you um, is the general scoring guidelines that are applied to the free response portion of the test. Um, each, as, as we have done so many practice FRQs and scored them, we have a good sense of how those rubrics work. Um, but what I wanna share with you are the, what are called the general scoring guidelines. These are the scoring guidelines that apply to every FRQ question. These are the ones from 2022. They could be slightly different in 2023, um, but in general, they do not change much or at all, or at all from year to year. Um, so a couple of things that I hope are not relevant, but you still may find reassuring. Um, any given part of a question, um, sometimes there's you know multiple parts, um, usually two, occasionally three, uh, no part can have a negative point total. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, a given penalty that we're about to talk about can only be applied once for a given question, even if you do it multiple times or in multiple parts. Um, in addition, uh, no more than three penalty points in terms of these general scoring guidelines can be applied for a given question. Okay, um, So that helps a little bit. Um, so let's look at some of the things that um, a student may do on the FRQ that would result in a one point penalty, this section here. Um, this first one is the one that I think I, I try to emphasize the most because students really struggle with it. If you can confuse, if you confuse the syntax for arrays and array lists, uh, square brackets versus get, for example, um, that's a one point penalty. Um, so please watch out for that. Every time you do anything with an array or an array list, specifically on FRQ question number three, pause and ask yourself if you're using and confirm you're using the appropriate syntax. If you write extra code that causes a side effect, you lose a point. Um, for example, if you do a system.out.print line, for example, um, because you're confusing printing with returning, which can be a common mistake, you're gonna not only not get the point for the return statement, you're also gonna lose a point for a side effect. Printing to output is a side effect. Um, if you chose to check for a precondition, even though you shouldn't, and it breaks something, you're going to lose a point. I mentioned that earlier today. Um, in general, extra code that doesn't cause any problems is not penalized, but uh, sometimes you have a bug in that extra code, and then you're going to lose this point. Um, if you have local variables in your code, which you usually do, but you don't declare any of them, you're going to lose a point. Um, on the flip side, to make this sound more positive, if you define a local variable in your code um, and then you forget to define the next local variable, you're not going to lose a point because at least you demonstrated that you understood that local variables do need to be declared um, because you did it once, even though you forgot it the second time. Um, fourth one here, destruction of persistent data. Um, some, uh, if you destroy data you're not supposed to destroy or change data you're not supposed to destroy, you're gonna lose a point. Where this shows up most commonly is you're implementing a method and that method has a parameter that refers to some sort of an object, um, perhaps a list, and you're not supposed to change that list or you're not supposed to change that array or you're not supposed to change the attributes of that object um, and your code does instead of maybe operating on a copy, um, in which case uh, you'll, you'll encounter this one point penalty. Um, this is kind of an odd one, um, but it seems very specific. Uh, in general, I, I don't see students run into this one, um, but if there is a method with a void return type um, and you try to return a value, it is okay to have return followed by a semicolon to end the method, but you try to return a value with a method with a void return type, it's a one point penalty. Or if you have a return statement in your constructor that returns a value, that is also a one point penalty. So these are five one point penalties that can be assessed on any given FRQ question. So these are definitely things you want to avoid. So that's the, that's the stuff to be aware of, the not so good news. Here's the good news. These are all things 
that you may do in your FRQ answers that do not receive a penalty, okay? If you write extra code and it doesn't have a side effect, uh, maybe you write code to check the preconditions, even, you shouldn't, even though you shouldn't waste time to do that. Um, you're not gonna be penalized. Spelling case discrepancies. You gotta be a little careful with this one. If you misspell something or if you don't have the right case and it's absolutely clear that it cannot be interpreted any other way, you won't be penalized. Where you have to be careful of that, however, is sometimes you name your variable the same as the class name and one is capitalized and one is not. That would that would be ambiguous and you would lose a point in that case. Um, so, you know, be, be careful with that, but be reassured that if you misspell array list, um, as they have in their example down here, um, you'll be just fine. Um, let's say you you're using a local variable, but you didn't declare it, but you did declare another local variable previously, like I mentioned up above, you will not receive a penalty. Um, if for some reason you put private or public on a local variable that you're declaring, you will not receive a penalty. Um, if you leave out public on the class or constructor, just the class or constructor, not like the methods, um, you won't receive a penalty. Um, if you accidentally use a Java keyword, a reserved word as an identifier, um, maybe you named a variable continue, um, that is not a penalty. You're not expected to have memorized every Java reserved word. Um, if you use like the common mathematical operations that you use in math class, rather than writing them exactly as they would be in um, Java, you will not receive a penalty. And note that you still have to use the operators. Like they have a little X here for multiplication. You can't just have two things in parentheses next to each other that will result in a penalty. Um, sometimes our brackets get confusing. We use square brackets instead of parentheses, instead of angle brackets. If you mix those up, no penalty. Um, if you use the assignment operator when you mean the equality operator or vice versa, there's no penalty there. Um, if you confuse length and size for array, string, list, or array list, and you have parentheses or don't have parentheses, um, no penalty there. I think the College Board realizes the inconsistencies within Java. Um, if you refer to the entire array, but you throw on an extra pair of square brackets, that's okay. If we're doing 2D arrays and you do I comma J notation instead of two pairs of square brackets, that won't be penalized. Um, if you're making a new array, this part is required. You don't need the square brackets with the size here. You just need empty square brackets, but if you throw it in here, that's okay. If you forget a semicolon, you're not gonna be penalized. If you forget curly brackets, but your indentation is clear, you will not be penalized. Okay, so the takeaway for this one is make sure to indent your code as you write it properly. Um, if it is not clearly indented and you leave out curly brackets, um, you, you, you will be penalized. Um, if you miss parentheses uh, because you invoke a method or constructor that doesn't take any arguments, um, that's okay. And if you forgot your parentheses around after the if for a while, that's okay too. There's a lot of stuff here. And so the reason why I think it's important for me to share this with you today is these are all things I don't want you to stress about as you are reviewing, preparing, and taking the AP exam. Um, so I hope you find that reassuring. Um, if you have questions about any of these, we can certainly talk about them later. All right, one final note on the scoring guidelines. Um, do not consider this no penalty list as a checklist of things you should do on the test. Your, one of your goals, besides demonstrating your strong understanding of computer science on the AP exam, is to make it as easy as possible for the AP reader, the person scoring your exam, to give you as many points as possible. Okay? You don't want to slow them down or confuse them um, by writing code that isn't as they expect. So don't try to do any of these things. Try to write a, the most um, clear uh, Java code built on the APCSA subset um, as reflected in the APCSA quick reference. Don't use odd constructs, don't use odd classes, don't use really weird approaches unless that's all you got. Um, make it easy, make their job easy. You want them to be able to glance at your code, have it look as they expect, give you lots of points and move on to the next question. So, all right, I hope this was helpful.